Okay, good evening everyone. Good evening IFNG and to Sir Marlon and for the rest of our team. Hi Gladys, hi Marvin, how are you doing? So it's I'm been a long good. time. It's been good. a long time Gladys. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mars, uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. M is there as well. Yeah. Yeah, Hi, Marvin. Good I, evening. I hope okay ka, Marvin, yeah. also. Yeah, so before anything else, uh, this um, next topic again, still same topic about I, um, IELTS versus TOEFL. So for you, um, kung mga bago kayo, um, so group and you don't have idea about TOEFL, this is the best time. And, and we are being lucky for a couple of months now because we are with, um, with Niner. And now we would like to welcome Sir Marlon. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So yeah, and thank you very Sir much Marlon. for that uh, wonderful introduction. So yeah, I would like to welcome everybody to the fourth and possibly the final part of our test talk series where we talk about the major differences between the TOEFL and the IELTS. So for those who have already been with us, we're going to do a little bit of review about what the TOEFL is all about, what's the purpose of the TOEFL and how it can help you make your dreams come true of pursuing a healthcare career in the US. So let me just share my presentation with all of you guys. So again, this is the final part of our test talk series. Looking forward for more presentations here at IFNG where I can talk about the TOEFL a little bit more. So just a little bit of a an invitation to everybody who's out there right now who needs help with preparing for the TOEFL. Um, we're inviting you to join our Facebook group, TOEFL Study Group Philippines. So one of the challenges that we have in our country is that there are very limited resources for TOEFL. And if you want to learn more about it, you want to get free materials, you want to be part of a community that will assist you and answer your questions related to the TOEFL, then please consider jo joining TOEFL Study Group Philippines. So on Facebook, simply type the name of our group or just type TOEFL Philippines and we will be one of the first groups that you will find on that social networking site. So again, it's TOEFL Study Group Philippines. And apart from that, um, I would like to give people a heads up of, about who I am. Uh, for those who have not yet watched any of our test talk videos, so my name is Lone, also known as Marlon. That's actually my, my full name, Marlon, but I prefer to be called Lone. Bucket Lone. <laughs> Because I'm alone. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, Lone. Uh, that's my nickname, Lone. And um, I've been working at 9.09er for more than six years now. Uh, prior to joining Niner, I was an English instructor at a local college here in Quezon City. And I also taught English to Chinese students online. And then I left the Philippines in 2019. I studied in Australia for one year where I also taught English, helped some students prepare for the IELTS exam. And in Australia, that's where I completed my IELTS teaching certification. Um, in order to get to Australia, I had to take an English exam. I took my IELTS in 2015, and it's only valid for two years. So obviously, I left the country in 2019. I needed to take another English exam at that time. So I had to take the TOEFL, the TOEFL IBT, which is also accepted in Australia if you're applying for a student visa. So my experiences with the TOEFL and the IELTS puts me in a position where I can talk about both exams based on my first-hand account, all right? So um, who needs to take the IELTS, by the way? So for people who are tuning in for the first time, for people who don't really know much about the IELTS, so it stands for International English Language Testing System. It's an English exam that tests your ability to speak, write, listen, and read English texts, okay? And it's an exam that people take if they want to to live, work, or study in an English-speaking country. The IELTS is very popular among healthcare professionals. We know what's going on in the Philippines right now. People, people want better compensation. People want better appreciation. People want better benefits. And all of those are available in English-speaking countries like the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland. So if you want to work as a healthcare professional in these countries, you have to take the IELTS. The UK and the US are among the top countries when it comes to compensating healthcare professionals very well. And that is why a lot of people do consider going to the US if they cannot pursue a career in the UK. You know, that very popular phrase, American dream. Everybody, everybody has an American dream. The problem is in states like, like Kansas and Nevada, 
they do not accept the IELTS. So don't get me wrong. The IELTS is widely accepted in the US, but there are two states that do not accept them, Kansas and Nevada. For that purpose, if you want to pursue a career in the US and you want to work in Kansas or Nevada, or maybe, maybe the IELTS has broken your heart <laughs> several times already. <laughs> You've taken it over and over again and you're not getting the result that you want. The TOEFL is an alternative for you, okay? The TOEFL is widely accepted in the U.S. because it's a product of the U.S. and it's the only English exam accepted in Kansas and Nevada. Sir, what about the OET? I've been hearing the OET a lot. The OET is only accepted in two states, namely um, Oregon and Florida. So yes, you can use the OET in the U.S., but your options are not that many. As to When you compare it to the TOEFL IBT where you are more eligible to practice nursing in more states because again it's widely accepted in that country and similar to the IELTS it also has a reading listening speaking and writing component so if they're pretty much the same what will be my deciding factor what what will make me choose the IELTS over the TOEFL and vice versa so let's have a review of what their major differences are so for test content like I said pretty much the same but there is a difference when it comes to the grading criteria. So the IELTS, you start with the listening section, followed by the reading section and the writing section on your test day. So let's say you filed for an exam on October 1. On that day, you will take your listening exam for approximately 40 minutes. For computer-delivered test takers, only 30 minutes. And then you move on immediately to the reading test. No breaks in between. You move on immediately to the reading exam, which lasts for about an hour. And then you end with the writing exam, which also lasts for about an hour. After a few days or before a few days, you will take your speaking exam. When it comes to the IELTS, you don't take all four tests in one sitting. Normally, there is a gap between the written components and the speaking exam. It could be a few days before the written tests, a few days after the written tests sometimes a few hours. But the bottom line is there is a gap. There is a gap between the written exams and the speaking exam. How are you assessed in the IELTS? They use a nine-band scale as their grading criteria. So the lowest possible score in each section of the exam is zero. The highest possible score is nine. And after that, the examiner will get the average of all your scores from four sections of the IELTS. So let's say you got eight in speaking, eight in writing, seven in reading, seven in listening, that means your overall band score for the IELTS exam would be around 7.5. In the TOEFL IBT, you start with reading instead of listening. So in the TOEFL IBT, you start with reading, followed by listening. After the listening exam, you have a 10-minute break. The 10-minute break is followed by the speaking test and you end with the writing exam. So that's the good thing about the TOEFL. You get a break between your tests. The challenge though is you have to complete all four sections of the test in one sitting. So let's say you filed for a test on October 1, you will take all four sections of the TOEFL on that day. Whereas in the IELTS, sometimes you get a little bit of breathing room because on a specific day, you could be just dealing with three sections and then the speaking exam will take place on some other day. Uh, that's the beauty of the IELTS. You, you get some time to recuperate before you take the other sections of the exam. The downside, especially when you're employed by, by a hospital, it's really hard to secure a day off, right? It's really hard to file for leave of absence. So having to do your test on two separate days can be a problem for some people. If that's your situation, if you're having a hard time <laughs> being granted two days off, then that means the TOEFL is for you. Yes, you're going to deal with four sections of the test, in one sitting, but that's it. After that, your misery is over. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it on some other day. Unlike the IELTS, the TOEFL uses a 30 scale grading system. The lowest possible score is zero. The highest possible score is 30 for each section of the exam. And unlike the IELTS where they get the average of your scores from each section of the exam in the TOEFL IBT, they will combine all your scores from all sections of the test. So let's say you got 20 in reading, 20 in listening, 20 in writing, 20 in speaking. That means your overall or total score in the TOEFL IBT is 
KT. So that's the difference. The IELTS uses a nine band scale. The TOEFL uses a grading criteria where 30 is the highest per section and the highest possible score in total is 120. When it comes to the length of the exam, the IELTS is the clear winner here because the total length of the IELTS is 173 minutes, whereas the TOEFL IBT takes approximately 188 minutes to complete. But again, keep in mind that with the IELTS, your speaking exam could take place on a different day. So that's another thing to keep in mind. When it comes to the test format, the IELTS comes in two. You have the paper-based version and the computer-delivered version. The TOEFL, it only comes in one format. It's computer-based. So TOEFL stands for Test of English as a Foreign Language. IBT stands for Internet-Based Test. So that alone tells you that you can only take this exam through a computer. Now, there are still some countries where the paper-based version of the TOEFL is being offered, but the paper-based version of the exam is available only in countries where you do not have access to the internet. In countries like the Philippines, where we have access to the internet, the paper-based version of the TOEFL has been phased out in favor of the computer-delivered version of the test. When it comes to price, the IELTS is fixed. It's at 11,650 pesos. What about the TOEFL? You're going to pay for the TOEFL in US dollars. So the problem there is the unpredictability of the price. If the US dollar, of course, starts getting higher in terms of value, if it starts becoming worth more than it is today, then your US dollar, your, your peso dollar exchange rate might mess up with your, with your budget. If the US dollar goes down against the Philippine peso, then, then good for you. But bottom line, you're going to pay 225 US dollars. So that's a little bit of a problem there if you are working on a tight budget. But at least thanks to this lecture, you already have an idea of how much money you should set aside. Almost every English exam right now for international certification is valid for two years. So when I say almost every English exam, that includes the IELTS, the TOEFL, the Pearson Test of English or PTE, you have CELPIP, Canadian English Language Proficiency Index Program, and OET, the Occupational English Test. All five valid for two years. How long will it take for you to find out your score? So in the IELTS for paper-based test takers, your results are available online, 13, 1, 3, 13 days from your test date. And your test result form or TRF will be mailed 13 days after your test date. For people who decided to take the computer-based version of the IELTS, your test result will be available online three to five days from your test date. And your test result form or the paper copy of your test result will be mailed to you three to five days after your test date. For the TOEFL, you're going to wait a little bit longer. It takes about six days for your test results to be available online. And the paper copy of your test results will be mailed to you 11 days after your test date. When it comes to the IELTS, you have second chances. What do I mean by that? Let's say you took the speaking test and the writing exam and your scores are not that good. You can file for remarking. Remarking means that the examiners will review your performance, review your output, and if you deserve a better score, they will raise your score. Let's say you applied for remarking because you got 6.5 in speaking and then they deem that you are worth more than that, you deserve more than that, then your 6.5 can become a 7. It saves you the trouble of having to take the exam all over again. But remarking is not free. Okay, At the moment, it costs 6,680 pesos. So we're broadcasting this on the 22nd of September in the Philippines again. At the moment, the price of remarking is 6,680 pesos. That includes the remarking fee, remarking fee rather, and the career fee. The good news is if your score does change, they will give you your money back. And remarking is only recommended for speaking and writing. For reading and listening, it's not recommended. So let me repeat that. Apply for remarking if you want your score in speaking and writing to change. So far, in our experience at 9.09er, we have never gotten reports of scores going down, 
normally when you apply for remarking, it either stays the same or it goes up. Now, what about the TOEFL IBT? The TOEFL IBT has a similar offering to test takers. They call it score review. So with the IELTS, your remarking fee covers both the speaking and the writing exam. With the TOEFL IBT, it's a different story. You have to pay $80 per section. So let's say you want your score for speaking reviewed, that's $80. You also want your score for writing reviewed, that's another $80. That's a total of $160. In Philippine peso, that's approximately, I think, 8,000 pesos if my math is correct. In my opinion, it's not worth spending on score review. Score review in the TOEFL IBT has a 10% success rate. That's very low. So take it from me. If you don't want to waste your money, it's much better to just take the test again instead of applying for score review. Whereas in the IELTS, there is a better chance of your score improving. We don't have exact statistics for that, but based on information we're getting from our students, a lot of people do experience better results after score review. In fact, I was just talking to two students earlier. I forwarded their test results to Sir Irvin because they were thanking us that their scores improved after remarking. So that's really a sign that in the IELTS, when your scores are not what you need, remarking is a viable option. All right? So those are the major differences between the TOEFL and the IELTS. If you are thinking of taking the TOEFL because you want to become a nurse in the US, of course, the name of the Facebook page is uh, IELTS Filipino Nurses Group, so <laughs> IFNG. So this uh, presentation is very nurse-centric, but keep in mind, if you're a PT, you're a med tech, you're an, you're an OT, you can also take the TOEFL if you want to pursue a career in the US. If we have viewers out there who want to apply for permanent residency in Australia, you can also take the TOEFL. You want to apply for student visa in an English-speaking country, the TOEFL is also a viable option. So again, this channel or this Facebook page caters to a lot of nurses. So let's focus on the needs of the nurses. If you want to take the TOEFL instead of the IELTS, you need to get a score of, uh, of 26 out of 30 in the speaking section and a total score of 83. That's regardless of your score in the other parts of the exam. So let's compare that. In the IELTS, you need 7. In speaking, an overall score of 6.5 regardless of your score in the other parts of the exam. In the TOEFL, 26 over 30 in speaking, a total score of 83 in the exam. So keep that in mind. Just like with the IELTS, the most important part of the exam for you is speaking. Be it the IELTS or the TOEFL, speaking is always the most important section. Even if you get a perfect score in reading, listening, or writing, if your score for speaking does not meet the requirements for visa screen, then I'm sorry, you cannot pursue a career in the U.S. just yet. You have to retake your test or in the case of the IELTS, consider applying for remarking. Excuse me about that. Um, so, so far, in the first three test talk videos, we talked about the differences between the IELTS speaking test and the TOEFL speaking test. We discussed IELTS writing, TOEFL writing, IELTS reading versus TOEFL reading. Tonight, we will talk about IELTS listening versus TOEFL listening. But before we get to the meat of the matter, let's recap. Okay, Based on my opinion, based on my experience as somebody who took both the TOEFL and the IELTS, okay, which is easier, IELTS speaking or TOEFL speaking? Objectively, IELTS speaking is easier. Why? There are no right or wrong answers. Whatever you say can be used as an answer as long as you can justify it. However, in my experience, TOEFL examiners are more lenient. There are certain things that you can do in the TOEFL. You can get away with certain mistakes in the TOEFL and you will be able to walk away with a good score. And when I say good, it's 26 or higher. All right? So with the TOEFL, the advantage of it is that you don't have to speak spontaneously. Why? You are given time to prepare. Every question comes with a preparation time and you don't have to generate your own answers. Whereas in the IELTS, you're pretty much relying on your memory. You're relying on what you know about things around you. With the TOEFL IBT, for the most part, there are questions where you can get answers from a passage and a recording. So while I want to say it's a tie 
while I want to say that it's up to you which speaking test is easier, in my experience, TOEFL speaking is much better for you because again, in my opinion, examiners are not as strict compared to IELTS examiners. Now, what about writing? Without a shadow of a doubt, if you review our video on IELTS writing versus TOEFL writing, I explicitly mentioned that TOEFL writing is easier because in the IELTS, you have to worry about numbers, especially when you're dealing with graphs and charts. In the TOEFL, that's not a problem because you're pretty much just summarizing information from a passage and recording for the first task. For the second task of both writing sections, it's pretty much the same. You're going to write an essay. Now, what about reading? I may be a proponent of the TOEFL. I may be advocating for it. But what our CEO, Mr. Irvin Temporal, always reminds us, we have to be transparent. I'm going to be honest with you. TOEFL reading is a lot harder than IELTS reading. Miss Gladys can attest to that. I made her answer TOEFL reading questions and she wanted to give up on me. So yes, TOEFL reading is harder than the IELTS reading exam. I was able to get a perfect score in the IELTS reading exam. I wasn't able to do that in the TOEFL reading exam. So to summarize, TOEFL speaking over IELTS, TOEFL writing over IELTS, but IELTS reading over TOEFL. Tonight, we're going to talk about the listening section, okay? I think we have some questions here. Oh, no, it's just um, Miss um, Gladys. Wait, is remarking scheduled on a different date and interviewed by a different examiner? That's a good question there, Mr. Um, Arellano. I I'm not able to see your first name. A remarking is not scheduled on a specific date, but obviously it will not happen immediately after your exam. It depends on when you filed for it, but there are specific parameters that you have to observe. For more information on that, you can visit the IELTS website or you can talk to any of our admin staff at 9.09er. And yes, it is interviewed by a different examiner. So let's say I'm your examiner the first time around, Mr. Arellano, then maybe when you apply for remarking, maybe Miss Gladys, let's say Miss Gladys is an examiner, she will be the one to review your performance. I hope that answers your question, okay? So let's keep moving forward. Oh, look at this guy. He's having a hard time hearing stuff. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the duration of the listening exam for each of these English tests. So in the IELTS, the good thing about the IELTS, it's fixed. If you're taking the computer-based version of the exam, you have 30 minutes to complete your listening section. If you're taking the paper-based version of the test, you are given 40 minutes. Sir Marlon, why am I given more time in the paper-based version of the exam? Well, with the paper-based version of the exam, you are given a test booklet and an answer sheet. All the questions are on the test booklet. Feel free to write whatever you want on your test booklet, but refrain, refrain from writing offensive and unacceptable symbols and language on your test booklet. Even if you get all your answers right, if you were not able to write them on your answer sheet, if all of your answers are on your test booklet, it's meaningless. You get zero. So that's why by the end of the test, you are given 10 minutes to transfer your answers from the test booklet to the answer sheet. That's why on the paper-based version of the IELTS, you have more time. Whereas with the computer-based version of the test, you don't have that luxury. Okay? In the IELTS exam for listening, you are going to listen to two conversations and two monologues. You will use information from these sources to answer a total of 40 questions. All right. How is that different from the TOEFL? The TOEFL is unpredictable. It can last for 41 minutes. It can last for 57 minutes. And for people who have seen our video on IELTS reading versus TOEFL reading, the reason behind that is the TOEFL likes to include unscored questions. Oh my goodness, sir. What are unscored questions? They look like normal questions, but they are not worth anything. Meaning to say whether you get them right or wrong, it will not matter in the grand scheme of things. Why do they do that, sir? Are they torturing us? Well, according to ETS, the maker of the TOEFL, so ETS stands for Education Training Services, I believe. So according to ETS, they put unscored questions to maintain the difficulty of the test. They want to make sure that, let's say on September 22, the difficulty of the exam on September 22 will be the same 
the following week and the week after that. So they include unscored questions to maintain the difficulty level of the TOEFL. If there are unscored questions in your listening exam, you will not have unscored questions in the reading test and vice versa. If your reading section contains unscored questions, you won't encounter them in the listening section anymore. How do you know that you have unscored questions in that part of the exam when it takes longer? If your exam for listening only lasts for 41 minutes, there are no unscored questions. If it lasts longer than 41 minutes, you have unscored questions. Sir Marlon, is there a way for me to find out what the unscored questions are? Unfortunately, despite thorough research, there are no clues that will help you identify which are the scored questions and which are the unscored questions. So the best course of action is just to treat every question as important questions, all right? So let me repeat that. If you are going to complete your exam in 41 minutes, no unscored questions. Anything beyond that, you have unscored, uh, unscored questions. A standard TOEFL listening exam contains three lectures and two conversations. If you get four lectures and three conversations, you have unscored questions. <laughs> Each lecture comes with six questions. Each conversation comes with five questions. What's the nature of the lectures? It's like attending a class in university. You're just listening to a professor discuss an academic topic. What about the conversations? So for conversations, you have two people discussing campus-related stuff. They're probably talking about working on group assignments. It could be discussing administrative matters related to campus life. Maybe they want to change courses. They want to look for different class schedules. Those sort of things. Those are the topics of the recordings in the TOEFL. You don't need to be an expert on those because similar to the IELTS, at the end of the day, all you have to do is listen to recognize answers that are mentioned by the speakers. But one challenge that, that's common between the IELTS and the TOEFL is paraphrasing. What do I mean by that? TOEFL questions will not use the same words in the recordings. It's the same story with the IELTS. So whether you're taking the IELTS or the TOEFL, your ability to recognize paraphrased information will come into play. So it's really important to know your synonyms and to understand paraphrased information. So for more information regarding the computer-delivered version of the IELTS, so we're, we're putting a little bit of an emphasis on the computer-delivered version of the IELTS since the TOEFL is also computer-delivered. So let me just make sure that I'm sharing my sound with you guys. Let me make sure also that some of my other social media accounts are closed so that we won't have any <laughs> unsettling noise. <laughs> okay, let's conduct a sound check. Were you guys able to hear that? I hope you were. If not, do let me know in chat. Let me just fix the volume controls. Okay. Someone's writing. <laughs> writing something. Let's play the video. For the listening test, you can change the volume by using the volume bar in the top right at any time during the test. For each part of the listening test, you will hear the recording once only. Some parts of the test have more than one type of question. Each type of question has its own instructions. In the listening test, listen carefully for the part number and question numbers to make sure you are looking at the right screen. For some questions, you need to write your answer in the gap. For some questions, you need to choose which diagram label, A, B, C, etc., is correct for which item listed in the table. For each question, click on the correct space in the table. For some questions, you need to click on an answer and move it into the gap. 
If you want to change an answer, move another answer into the gap. If you want to leave the question unanswered, move the question back. And for some questions, you need to move an answer into a gap on a diagram. At the end of the listening test, you'll have two minutes to check all of your answers. The tests will automatically stop when the time finishes. Okay, thank you very much for that. So that's a wonderful video from our friends at IDP. So one of the owners of the IELTS exam. By the way, in case you guys are wondering if you're interested in taking the IELTS in the Philippines, I highly recommend that you take it with IDP for the time being um, because uh, they're able to carry out IELTS exams. So for this September, they can still carry out IELTS exams. I think the British Council is still trying to, uh, trying to sort it out, but I believe that once they've sorted out uh, matters from their end, they too will resume offering IELTS exams. So for those who are planning to take the IELTS in the Philippines for this month, I suggest you coordinate with with IDP. Okay. If you need help filing for your exam, please feel free to coordinate with us at 9.09er IELTS Review Center. We will be more than happy to help you. And once the British Council is also up and running when it comes to offering IELTS exams, we can also help you book tests with them. So I hope the video presentation earlier gave you an idea on what to expect regarding the listening section of the computer-delivered version of the IELTS. Now, what about the TOEFL IBT. So right now we have a screenshot of the sixth edition of the official guide to the TOEFL. So this is an official ETS product. What you're seeing right now will resemble the same software in the actual TOEFL IBT. Okay. There are some minor differences with the aesthetics, maybe differences with font style and color, but pretty much the same features at its core. So on the upper left, uh, or sorry, upper right corner of your screen, you will find the timer. This will show you how much time you have left when it comes to your exam. And then you have the next button. You click on the next button when you're done answering the question, when you're already happy with your answer. And in the TOEFL, all questions in the listening section are multiple choice. You don't have to identify a word. You don't have to write a word. So spelling, spelling is not going to be a problem. <laughs> if you're constantly having problems with spelling, don't worry about that in the TOEFL IBT, all right? So all you have to do in the TOEFL is click on your preferred answer, all right? Beside every answer is a circle. Click on the circle beside your preferred answer, and there you go. Now, the problem, once you click the next button, there's no going back. So unlike the IELTS exam where you can skip questions, in the TOEFL, you cannot do that. So if you're familiar with chess, <laughs> the phrase touch move, touch, touch please <laughs> is actually true here. So once you've selected your answer and you click next, you cannot revisit it anymore. You have to be decisive. So we can say that that's something that goes against the TOEFL IBT. You cannot skip questions. But in my experience, I got 28 over 30 in the TOEFL listening exam with pretty much minor preparation. And I think it speaks to how easy the TOEFL listening exam is. And we will talk more about that later. I'm not saying that it's perfect, that it's superior to the IELTS exam, but there are certainly certain things that are going in favor of the TOEFL when it comes to the listening section. The problem also with the TOEFL IBT is, unlike the IELTS, so the way that it works in the IELTS is, when you hear the recording, you can see the question together with your ability to hear the recording. So that means, okay, the recording is playing. I can see my question. I know what kind of information I'm looking for. With the TOEFL, that's not the case. With the TOEFL, you will see a picture first that will give you a context or on what you're going to hear. So we have two people right now on the screen. That means we're about to hear a conversation. And then on the bottom part of our software, you can adjust the volume according to your preference, obviously. And then you have here the bar that shows you how long the recording will be. The problem with the TOEFL IBT, so see, I'm being transparent. Even though I'm a proponent of the TOEFL, I'm telling you the problems with it. The problem with the TOEFL IBT, you don't get to see questions. 
while the recording is played. And it's only played once. So if you're not taking notes, you're in trouble. All right. Whereas in the IELTS, while you're listening, you can immediately answer questions because, hey, I can see the question while I'm hearing the speakers. In the TOEFL, that's not the case. Recording first, questions later. So that's, that's adding a level of difficulty when it comes to taking notes because you don't exactly know what to write down since, hey, they're talking and I don't see the question. So what am I supposed to write down? In my experience, everything. <laughs> No, not literally. Write down everything important. How do you know it's important? Normally, the first thing that the speakers say is valuable because we're going to talk about this again, but in TOEFL listening, they have what they call gist content or gist purpose questions. And the answer to that type of question is normally found in the first sentences that the speakers said. So pay attention to what they say first. Pay attention to, to main ideas Pay attention to keywords like nouns, pronouns, action words, adjectives, adverbs. Pay attention to examples. And then determine the relationship between information in the recording. How is it organized? Is it causal? Meaning to say, in lectures especially, is the speaker talking about a phenomena and what caused it? Is the lecturer talking about an event? So if the lecturer or professor is talking about an event, then you have to take note of events in a chronological manner. Is the professor talking about theories? So maybe the professor will arrange them according to likelihood, which is more likely to happen, which is least likely to happen. Maybe the professor will talk about general information to specific information. That's why you have examples. So knowing the connection of ideas Identifying main ideas and their supporting ideas will come into play in the TOEFL IDP. Another tip that I can give is that you don't need to write complete words. So if you were born or you were already using smart devices or cell phones in the mid-2000s, you will be familiar with the term jejemon. So when you take notes, it's all about removing the vowels. Don't write the vowels anymore, just the consonants. And find the balance between taking notes and listening. A lot of people that struggle with listening exams, be it OET, be it TOEFL, be it the IELTS, be it PTE, these people struggle because they're just writing down stuff without understanding them. So even if you have notes, if you don't understand what those words mean or what those words represent, they're pretty much useless. So find the balance between understanding and taking notes. Don't simply write for the sake of writing. Understand what you are hearing. Because if you truly listen, you will be able to answer questions. All right? So after the recording is played, then you get to see the question. There you go. So that's how the TOEFL IDE listening section works. Other specific differences of the IELTS listening section and the TOEFL listening section. The IELTS is a product of IDP, Cambridge, and the British Council. Because of that, majority of speakers have a British accent. What do we mean by a British accent? It's similar to the American accent. So let's establish that first. What's the American accent? The American accent is the accent used by people who voice characters in Disney films. So what's your favorite Disney film? So I'm a big fan of Toy Story. Growing up, I watched Aladdin, Pocahontas. Those kinds of programs, we grew up, grew up on those. If you're familiar with, with Sesame Street, a lot of the characters there have a North American accent. If you're familiar with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, with the Power Rangers, the characters there, the actors there have a North American accent. But what about the British accent? It's similar to the American accent, but they have glottal stops. Historically speaking, British accent is, of course, let's just say existed for a longer time than American accent. But just to help you better understand their differences, with the British accent, speakers have a glottal stop. And when we say glottal stop, the tendency of the speaker is to lose the R. Okay, when they're speaking, the R. All right, for example, instead of saying, Filipinos will sound like this, mother. <laughs> Matigas, mother, right? <laughs> How do Americans say it? Mother, mother, mother. You still hear the R, mother. It's still pronounced. But with people who have British English or a British accent, they say mother, 
mother. The letter R disappears. Okay, it's not that pronounced. The same thing can be said about letter T. All right. So sometimes the letter T for people with have a British accent, it's not as pronounced. Instead of saying, so Filipinos will say ice water, water, water. That's how Filipinos would say it. And then Americans would say water, water, water. The letter T becomes a D. But with people who have a British accent, the letter T somewhat disappears. Wa -a, wa -a. So to help you better understand, this is how people with a British accent sound. So let me play it. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an agent at a company which ships large boxes overseas. Good morning, Packham's shipping agents. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I'm ringing to make inquiries about sending a large box, uh, a container, back home to Kenya from the UK. Yes, of course. Would you like me to try and find some quotations for you? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I need a few details from you. Fine. Can I take your name? It's Jacob M. Kerry. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes, it's M-K-E-R-E. -E. Is that M for mother? Yes. Thank you. And you say that you will be sending the box to Kenya? That's right. And where would you like the box picked up from? From college, if possible. Yes, of course. I'll take down the address now. It's Westall College. Is that W-E-S-T-A-L-L? -L? Yes, college. Westall College. And where's that? It's Downlands Road in Bristol. Oh, yes, I know it. And the postcode? It's BS89PU. Right. And I need to know the size. Yes, I've measured it carefully and it's 1.5 metres long. Right. 0.75 metres wide. OK. And it's 0.5 metres high or, or, or deep. Great. So I'll calculate the volume in a moment and get some quotes for that. But first, can you tell me, you know, very generally, what will be in the box? Yes, uh, th there's mostly clothes. OK. And there's some books. OK, good. Um, anything else? Uh, yes, th there's also some toys. OK, and what is the total value, do you think, of the contents? Well, the main costs are the clothes and the books. They'll be about £1,500. But then the toys are about another 200 So I'd put down £1,700. All right. So I think uh, one of our moderators actually noticed it, right? The speaker did not say mother, mother. So the letter R disappeared. <laughs> People in the UK are magicians. They make the letter R disappear. Okay, so there you go. That's how people with a British accent sound. That's a sample of a conversation in a typical IELTS listening exam. Now, what about the TOEFL? How do people sound? What is the American accent? Okay, so let's listen to a sample conversation from a TOEFL practice test. All right. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an agent Hi, Elizabeth. at a company. Hey, Coach. I just thought I'd stop by to see what I missed while I was gone. Well, we've been working real hard on our plan for the next game. I've asked Susan to go over it with you before practice this afternoon, so you'll know what we're doing. Okay. By the way, how did your brother's wedding go? Oh, it was beautiful. And the whole family was there. I saw aunts and uncles and cousins I hadn't seen in years. So it was worth the trip. Oh, definitely. I'm sorry I had to miss practice, though. I feel bad about that. Family's very important. Yep. Okay, uh, I guess I'll see you this afternoon at practice, then. Just a minute. There are a couple of other things I need to tell you. Oh, okay. Um, first, everybody's getting a new team jacket. Wow. How'd that happen? Uh, a woman who played here about 20, 25 years ago came through town a few weeks ago. So we're not going to listen to the entirety of that because we're going to hear that again when we review conversations for 
TOEFL listening. But one thing that you will notice is when it comes to the way that the speakers with an American accent talk, the letter R is very pronounced, right? They say brother. They don't say brother. They say brother. So the letter R is clearly pronounced. Uh, other differences between the IELTS and the TOEFL is the type of vocabulary used. So British, obviously, British English is for the IELTS, American English for the TOEFL. So what do you mean by that, sir? A good example of this would be the word elevator. Okay? Americans say elevator, but what about people in the UK? They do not say elevator. What do they say? Can anyone tell me? Can you type in chat what do you think the answer is? If it's not elevator in the UK, what do they say? All right. They say lift. That's right. They use the word lift. So it's also important to understand the differences between the two when it comes to word choice. Because in the Philippines, when do we use lift? We use it for directions. This is the right. This is the lift. No, just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that here, of course. We know the difference. All right. So <laughs> other differences. Other differences. Um, this, this one's interesting. Um, people in the US, they say bathroom. But in, in the UK, what do they say? The UK also always makes it sound fancy. What do they say? What do they say? They say, if it's bathrobe for Americans, bathrobe, people in the UK, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not referring to bathroom. I said bathrobe, the one that you wear. Not bath, bathroom, bathrobe, the one that you wear, bathrobe. They call it dressing gown. <laughs> Mayaman, dressing gown. So think about that. <laughs> it's, it's a robe in the US, but it's a gown in the UK. Uh, other key differences uh, would include French fries in the US, but they call it chips in the UK. So it's really important to learn about the differences between the two because you might be thinking of a different meaning for a certain word, like lift. Like when you're in the Philippines, obviously you've been exposed largely to the American accent. The first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word lift is the actual word lift. You're taking something from a low level to a higher level, you're lifting it up. But when you're dealing with the IELTS, it's actually the synonym of elevator. So you have to be mindful of that. When it comes to question types, the IELTS is, is dominated by short answer questions. Normally, you have blanks, you have questions where you have to write down the answer. This is where the TOEFL wins. Why? In the IELTS, you have to know the correct spelling of the word. If you don't spell it correctly, you're not going to get points for that, even though you heard the answer. With the TOEFL, that's not going to be an issue. Because again, with the TOEFL, everything is multiple choice. So you don't have to worry about spelling words correctly. Okay? Hi, Elizabeth. Now, when it comes to the instructions, um, in the IELTS, sometimes you will be instructed to complete forms. So you will see a form with missing information. You have to complete it. Maybe you have to take note of a date, a person's last name, somebody's age. Sometimes you have incomplete tables, sometimes you have incomplete notes, sometimes you have incom incomplete flowcharts, sometimes you have incomplete sentences. Now, this is the tricky part. And this is, again, where the TOEFL wins. Why? Sentence completion questions are tricky because for the most part in the IELTS, you want to answer in verbatim. What you hear is what you write down. The problem with sentence completion questions, you also have to take grammar rules into account. Even if you heard the exact word, but if you place it in the sentence and it makes the sentence grammatically wrong, that makes your answer wrong. So that's the challenging part. You don't have sentence completion questions in the TOEFL. So on top of hearing the answer apart from spelling it correctly, now you also have to worry about grammar in the IELTS. And this is not the only type of question that, that comes with this challenge. Summary completion questions pretty much require you to do the same thing. For sentence completion, you have a sentence with a missing word. Summary completion, you have a paragraph with missing words. So again, grammar comes into play. And then you have matching type questions where you're going to match um, information from a certain column with another column or sometimes information from a certain recording. You have to match it with, with the source. And then you have detailed questions where you have to pick the correct answer out of a list of wrong answers. So in the IELTS, sometimes you get three choices, sometimes four choices, and then 
you have to determine oh which which one of this which one of these choices is the correct answer so there you go those are the types of instructions in the IELTS now what about the TOEFL we're going to talk about them in detail later we have gist content gist purpose we have function detail connecting content attitude inference and organization questions all right before we look at the questions i highly encourage everyone to try and take notes why this will help you determine if the TOEFL is for you if you can get a lot of the questions right maybe it's an indication that instead of taking the IELTS you should try the the TOEFL okay so i'm going to play a sample lecture Take note of the topic that the professor is discussing. Write down any examples that he mentions. And try to establish connections between the ideas that he will present. First, listen to the excerpt. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a novel that uh, some critics consider the finest detective novel ever written. Um, it was also the first. We're talking about The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. Now, um, there are other detective stories that preceded the Moonstone historically, um, notably uh, the work mm, of the uh, Edgar Allan Poe's mm. stories, uh, such as The Murders in the Rue mm. Morgue, mm. uh, The Purloined Letter. Now, these were short stories that featured a detective, probably the first to do that. But the Moonstone, which follows them by about 20 years, it was published in 1868, uh, this is the first full-length detective novel ever written. Now, in The Moonstone, if you read it as, uh, uh, come to it as a, a contemporary reader, what's interesting is that most of the features you find in almost any detective novel are, in fact, already present. Um, it's hard at this juncture to read this novel and realize that no one had ever done that before because it all seems so strikingly familiar. It's, uh, it's really a wonderful novel, and I recommend it even just as a fun book to read if you've never read it. Um, so, uh, in The Moonstone, as I said, uh, Collins did much to establish the conventions of the detective genre. Uh, I'm not going to go into the plot at length, but, uh, you know, the, the basic setup is um, there's this diamond of great, uh, of great value, um, a country house. Uh, the diamond mysteriously disappears in the middle of the night. Um, the local police are brought in uh, in an attempt to solve the crime and they mess it up completely, uh, and then the true hero of the book arrives. That's Sergeant Cuff. Now, Cuff, this extraordinarily important character, um, well, let me try to give you a, a sense of who Sergeant Cuff is by first describing the regular police. And uh, this is the dynamic that you're going to see throughout the history of the detective novel. Um, where you have the regular cops uh, who are well-meaning but officious and bumblingly inept. And uh, they are countered by a figure who's eccentric, analytical, brilliant, and, and able to solve the crime. So uh, first, the regular police get called in to solve the mystery. Uh, in this case, Detective uh, uh, Superintendent Seagrave. When Superintendent Seagrave comes in, uh, he orders his minions around. Uh, they bumble, and uh, they actually make a mess of the investigation, uh, which you'll see repeated. Uh, you'll see this pattern repeated, uh, particularly in the Sherlock Holmes stories of a few years later, where uh, Inspector Lestrade, this well-meaning idiot, is always countered uh, by Sherlock Holmes, uh, who's a genius. So, now, Cuff arrives. Uh, Cuff is the man who's coming to solve the mystery. A and again, he has a lot of the characteristics that future detectives throughout the history of this genre will have. Um, he's eccentric. Um, he has a hobby that he's obsessive about. In this, uh, in this case, it's uh, the love of roses. He's a, a fanatic about the breeding of roses. A and here, think of Nero Wolfe and his orchids. 
uh, Sherlock Holmes and his violin. Uh, a lot of those later classic detective heroes have this kind of outside interest that they, uh, they go to uh, as a kind of antidote to the evil and misery they encounter in their daily lives. Now, um, these detective heroes, uh, they have this characteristic of being smart, incredibly smart, but of not appearing to be smart. And uh, most importantly, from a, a, a kind of existential point of view, uh, these detectives see things that other people do not see. And that's why the detective is such an important figure, I think, in our modern imagination. Um, in the case of the Moonstone, uh, I don't want to say too much here and spoil it for you, but the clue that's key to uh, the solving of the crime is a smeared bit of paint in a doorway. Um, of course, the regular police have missed this paint smear or made some sort of unwarranted assumption about it. Cuff sees this smear of paint, uh, this paint, the, the place where the paint is smeared, and and realizes that from this one smear of paint, you can actually deduce the whole situation, um, the whole world. A and that's what the hero in a detective novel like this brings to it that the other characters don't. It's, um, it's this ability to see meaning where others see no meaning and to bring order to where uh, it seems there is no order. Okay, so that's a typical TOEFL IBT lecture. So it's pretty long, but I would say it's just as long as what you will hear in section four of the IELTS listening exam. So pretty much same length when it comes to the recordings. Yes, for you to participate and do the practice. Yep, thank you very much for that advice. So yeah, again, um, we did encourage you guys to take notes earlier so that later you can answer questions and see if this test is for you. W will it serve as an alternative to the IELTS for you, okay? So let's now go to our sample conversation. So what you heard earlier was a sample lecture. This one is a sample conversation. Again, I encourage you to take notes because in the actual exam, you don't get to see the questions right away. You hear the recordings and then that's when you see the questions. But obviously, we're doing it in a little bit different manner compared to the actual TOEFL IBT. In the actual TOEFL IBT, you hear the recording after that, the question. But in this presentation, we're going to listen to a lecture and a conversation consecutively for us to just have a general idea of what things sound like in your TOEFL listening exam. So here we go. Let's play our conversation. First, we'll listen to part of a conversation between a coach and a student, catching up on what happened while the student was away. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, coach. I just thought I'd stop by to see what I missed while I was gone. Well, we've been working real hard on our plan for the next game. I've asked Susan to go over it with you before practice this afternoon, so you'll know what we're doing. Okay. By the way, how did your brother's wedding go? Oh, it was beautiful, and the whole family was there. I saw aunts and uncles and cousins I hadn't seen in years. So it was worth the trip. Oh, definitely. I'm sorry I had to miss practice, though. I feel bad about that. Family's very important. Yep. Okay, uh, I guess I'll see you this afternoon at practice then. Just a minute. There are a couple of other things I need to tell you. Oh, okay. Uh, first, everybody's getting a new team jacket. Wow, how'd that happen? Uh, a woman who played here about... 20, 25 years ago, came through town a few weeks ago and saw a game and said she wanted to do something for the team, so... So she's buying us new jackets? Yep. Wow, that's really nice of her. Yes, it is. It's great that former players still care so much about our school and our basketball program. Anyway, you need to fill out an order form. I'll give it to you now so you can bring it back this afternoon. I've got the forms from the other players, so as soon as I get yours, we can order. Maybe we'll have the jackets by the next game. Okay. Great. And the next thing is, you know Mary's transferring to another college next week. So we'll need someone to take over her role as captain for the second half of the season. And the other players unanimously picked you.
to take over as captain when Mary leaves. Wow. I saw everybody this morning and nobody said a word. They wanted me to tell you. So, do you accept? Of course. All right, so that's our sample conversation. So, one thing that you have to be mindful of when it comes to conversations, normally there's a problem that the two people are going to to solve and that problem is also worth taking note of as well as the solutions that they will come up with all right now let's talk about the questions that you will face in the TOEFL IBE listening section what are the instructions so for just content questions you have to figure out what is the main topic of your speakers what are they mainly talking about so let's take a good look at our question what are the speakers mainly discussing is it letter A how the woman should prepare for the next game? Is it letter B? The woman's responsibilities as team captain. Letter C, things that happened while the woman was away. Or letter D, is it the style of the new uniforms? Now, please use your notes. But if you were not able to take notes, we have a transcript of our conversation earlier. All right? So I'm going to give you guys about, let's say, 30 seconds to figure out the answer to this question okay but do bear in mind bear in mind in the actual TOEFL exam there are no transcripts please remember that there are no transcripts I'm just giving you a copy of the transcript for our reference so that we can better understand why certain answers are such but yeah I'll give you 30 seconds guys try to figure out what's the correct answer using information from your notes and from the transcript okay 30 seconds start now Okay, guys, what do you think is the answer? Feel free to type your answer. You don't need to speak up. You can type it in chat. What do you think is the correct answer? And if you still are not convinced about your answer, maybe we can play the recording one more time. I think I have an excerpt of this. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Coach. I just thought I'd stop by to see what I missed while I was gone. Well, we've been working real hard on our plan for the next game. I've asked Susan to go over it with you before practice this afternoon, so you'll know what we're doing. Okay. So, yeah. What do you think is the answer? So, we have a lot of people saying it's letter C. All right. So, good job, guys. The answer is actually letter C. Very good. So, like I said, there are times when the first thing that they mentioned will be the answer to your question. And that's what GIST content and GIST purpose questions are pretty much all about. What is the first thing that they said? That's going to be the answer. If you have a GIST content question, you will not encounter a GIST purpose question anymore. If you have a GIST purpose question, you will not encounter a GIST content question for that specific recording anymore. Right. So this is an example of a GIST purpose question. So as you can see, pretty similar. But this time, instead of asking what the speakers are talking about, this question is asking a purpose, a purpose of one of the speakers. All right, so what's the purpose of the student for seeing the coach? Why does the student go to see the coach? So based on what you heard earlier, what do you think is the answer? Is it letter A, to see how the woman should prepare for the next game? Is it letter B, the woman's responsibilities as team captain? Is it letter C, to find out what, ha what, what had happened while the woman was away? Or is it letter D, to discuss the style of the new team uniforms. Is it A, B, C, or D? Again, feel free to type your answer in chat, guys. What do you think is the answer? And again, if you're not confident about it, you can refer to our transcript, but be reminded in the actual exam, there is no transcript, okay? There is no transcript in the actual exam. In fact, I'll play the recording again for you to help you determine the answer. 
Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Coach. I just thought I'd stop by to see what I missed while I was gone. Well, we've been working real hard on our plan for the next game. I've asked Susan to go over it with you before practice this afternoon, so you'll know what we're doing. Okay. Okay, guys, so I'm giving you 30 seconds to figure it out. What do you think is the answer? Your 30 seconds start now. Again, feel free to type your answer in chat. All right, we have some people typing their answers already. Good job. Okay. Wow, Jen is so fast. He's a oh. convert to tofilism. Andrea, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> it's time to turn your back on the church of the IELTS <laughs> and join tofilism. <laughs> Good job, ladies and gentlemen. So the answer for that question is letter C. Great, great job. See, it's not that hard, right? But again, in the actual exam, you don't get to, to see the transcript. So taking notes will play a huge role in your success. <laughs> baptizing. Yes, we are in the process of baptizing, and uh, Miss uh, Gladys. Now, let's go to another instruction. This one is a little bit difficult. Um, this is what we call function questions. So the problem with function questions, unlike just purpose and just content questions, where the answers are explicitly stated, for function questions, you're looking for answers that are suggested or implied. So you have to understand real meaning versus surface meaning because those are two different things. So I'll give you an example of, of surface meaning. Let's say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Okay, that question, if I just say it in a monotonic manner, in a monotonous manner, who do you think you are? It's basically asking for information about your identity. But let's say, let's say you crashed my party. You crashed my party. You started eating my food without me inviting you there. And you said, hey, I'm going to eat all your food. I don't care if, you're, if, you're, if you invited me or not. And then my reaction is, who do you think you are? I'm not asking you for your identity. That's me expressing my disapproval to your action. So that's pretty much the goal here with function questions. You're not really analyzing the statement based on its surface meaning. You're analyzing it for what the speaker really meant. So one thing to watch out for would be changes in intonation patterns and other ideas brought up by your speakers, okay? So let's look at our sample function question. What does the man mean when he says family is very important? So what is the function of that statement? What does it truly mean? Is it letter A, he hopes the woman's family is doing well? Is it letter B, he would like to meet the woman's family? Is it letter C, the woman should spend more time with her family? D, the woman had a good reason for me missing practice? And we already have people answering. Oh, Jen is consistently fast. Okay, Jen, <laughs> I baptize you a toffler. <laughs> good job. That was very fast, Jen. Good on you. Andrea, good job. Okay, this, this person has a very unique name. Galaxy A52. Wow. Your parents really thought about their name. They don't want you to have difficulty securing an NBI clearance. Okay, good job with your name. <laughs> Jana, good job. Letter D. Yeah. Why is letter D the answer? All right. So let's look for reference. So our speaker said family is very important somewhere here. All right. But Look at what the speaker said. So it was worth the trip. It was worth the trip. I feel bad about that. He went, she went to see her family. She feels bad about it. But it's like the coach is consoling her. Like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with what you did. If you look at the other choices, the problem with letter A, well, there is no indication from their discussion that this is what the coach meant. Uh, with letter B, we also cannot get this kind of idea from the statements of the coach. He did not express any desire to interact with the girl's family. The same thing can be said with letter C. That's why letter D is the correct answer. Okay, For everyone who got the correct answer, you are now taking the first step toward Tofelism. <laughs> and in the Philippines, the church of Tofelism is found at 9.09. I am the pastor of Topelis. <laughs> all right, all right. So 
So now let's uh, proceed to our next um, question. Okay. Um, yeah, please be reminded. I think Ms. Gladys mentioned this. Uh, make sure that your uh, microphones are muted so that we will not be interrupted in the middle of our discussions. So we have a detailed question here. Detailed questions are very straightforward. So let's recap. Okay, this content, this purpose, first things that the speaker said. Function question, not straightforward. You can, you have to rather, you have to figure out. You have to figure out the answer to the question. You have to understand the difference between real meaning versus surface meaning. Now, what about detailed questions? They're very straightforward. As the name implies, you have to look for details. So what is the question? Who is buying new jackets for the team? Is it letter A, the coach? B, the captain of the team? Letter C, a former player? D, a group of basketball fans? Pam, with the answer. Pam wants to convert to Tofilism. So fast, Pam. Good job, Bell. Galaxy A52, again, with the unique name. Andrea, with the Spanish last name. That's so Filipino, right? When you have an English first name and the Spanish last name, that's so Filipino, right? Andrea Bosotros, right? You meet a lot of people like that, right? The Jomar Santos, like that's a very, you have an American first name and a Spanish last name. I cannot relate to that because my last name is Portuguese, right? Yardo. You don't encounter a lot of people with that last name in the Philippines. I'm Portuguese because when I was young, my lola used to hit me and she said, Portuguese kang bata ka. So, <laughs> I'm unlike you guys. I don't have a Spanish last name. I'm Portuguese, according to my grandmother at the very least. Okay? Anyway. <laughs> um, going back with our um, question and answers here, a lot of people chose... Um, Letter C is the correct answer. Um, and why is letter C the correct answer here? So we can find our reference okay. for our answer uh, here. Right here. A woman who played here about 20 to 25 years ago came through town a few weeks ago and saw a game. And she said she wanted to do something for the team. And then the female student said, so she's buying us new jackets, which the male coach Confirm. That's why the answer is letter C. Good job. Okay, for people who got the correct answer, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Join the Church of Tophilism. <laughs> what about connecting content? So for connecting content, as the name implies, you have to find out the relationship of different ideas in the answers and the statements of your speakers. Okay? So this is actually a lot easier because figuring out the relationship of information in the TOEFL is easier than figuring out your own relationship. <laughs> Hashtag who goat. Okay. So our question is, why is the woman surprised to learn that she has been chosen as the new team captain? So you have to choose two answers. Always read instructions carefully, ladies and gentlemen. Failure to follow instructions have resulted into a lot of broken dreams so what is the answer two answers by the way letter a she is not the best player on the team is that why she's surprised is it letter b her teammates did not tell her about the decision is it letter c she does not have many friends on the team is it letter d she has missed a lot of practices wow again a trifecta of very fast responders what about the rest are we just going to be confident with pam jana and galaxy's answers what about the rest Look at the transcript, okay? If, if you cannot remember what was played, look at the transcript. Okay, even Jen says it's A and B. What do you think? What about the rest of our other viewers and participants? I don't want to participate, sir. <laughs> I am a passive viewer. <laughs> I am a silent participant here. <laughs> okay, Andrea, with the clutch answer, it's A and B as well. So letter A and B are the correct answers. Why is that? And so, letter A and letter B are the correct answers because of the following reasons. Okay, let's see what the male coach said. We'll need someone to take over for the captain of their team because the captain will be moving to a new school. Okay, the other players unanimously pick our female speaker. All right, so she said, wow, I saw everybody this morning and nobody said a word. So nobody told her about this decision. So that's why she's surprised. That means letter B is correct. 
what about letter A? What is the support for letter A? Okay, so she accepted the offer to be captain, but she's surprised. Why? Susan's a much better player than I am. So that's why the answers are letter A and B. All right? That, that's the connection of those two answers. They are both her reasons for being surprised. Surprise! <laughs> Good job. Now, we're going to talk about attitude questions. When it comes to attitude questions, it's important to pay attention to intonation patterns. When a professor or a speaker changes his or her intonation, that could be a sign that that's important information. So if a speaker is talking in an exaggerated manner, that could mean excitement. If a speaker pauses a lot, if your speaker is pausing a lot, that could be a sign of uncertainty. What, what's an example of a, a speaker that pauses a lot? Um, Marlon, you're invited to the birthday party of Patrick. It will be happening on the 23rd of September. Wait a minute. 23rd of September. Isn't that Joshua's birthday? Why did you say it's Patrick's birthday? So the way that your speaker does that, when your speaker is pausing a lot, that could be a sign of uncertainty. Okay, that means your speaker lacks confidence in what he or she is saying. Take note of that. A speaker is talking a little bit faster. That could mean anything between annoyance, anger. Listen to the intonation of your speakers. That will reveal their attitude. Okay, so for our question here, what attitude does the professor express when he says, um, it's hard at this juncture to read this novel and realize that no one had ever done that before because it all seems so strikingly familiar. Now, I was not able to do that justice. So let's listen to the professor one more time. Now, in The Moonstone, if you read it as, uh, uh, come to it as a, a contemporary reader, what's interesting is that most of the features you find in almost any detective novel are, in fact, already present. Um, it's hard at this juncture to read this novel and realize that no one had ever done that before because it all seems so strikingly familiar. It's, uh, it's really a wonderful novel, and I recommend it even just as a fun book to read if you've never read it. Okay, guys. So notice how the speaker somehow increased the volume of his voice when he said, no one had ever done that before. So why do you think he did that? What's his attitude? Was he impressed by the novel's originality? Was he concerned that students may find the novel difficult to read? Is it letter C? Was he bored by the novel's descriptions of ordinary events? Or was it letter D? Was he eager to write a book about a less familiar subject? What do you think is the answer, guys? A, B, C, or D? I'm going to give you time. If you want to put your faith in Pam, who seems to be willing to convert to Topilism, that's up to you guys. But what do you think? Is Pam correct? Is it letter A? What about the rest of the gang? Again, you don't need to speak. Just type your answer in chat. Okay. Miss Gladys said letter B. <laughs> For the sake of being different. Miss Chris has said A. All right. Cool. Cool. For all we know, there could be people on Facebook answering the question too. They're holding, they're holding their end of the bargain. Okay, I'm answering right now. I hope I got it right. <laughs> Audrey. Audrey got letter A as, a as her answer. All right, it's been 30 seconds. Okay, the correct answer is actually letter A. Notice how he emphasized no one. No one had ever done that before. If no one did it before, you're the first. If you're the first, then original would be something that comes to your mind. So that's why the answer here is letter no. Letter A. He is impressed by the novel's originality. That's why he said that. That's what his attitude was. He was impressed by, by the writer being able to do something that no one has ever done before. Okay? Now let's go to inference questions. Similar to function questions, with inference questions, the answers are not directly stated. So, the best approach here is, is to treat yourself as a detective, okay? 
the answer will not make a huge logical disconnection from what is said in the recording. Yes, the exact words will not be used, but bottom line, there will be a connection. The answers are not directly stated, but there's evidence in the recording to support the answer. So you're a detective here. You have to draw conclusions based on evidence given to you by the speaker. So detectives, listen to what our speaker has to say. So the question is, what does the professor imply when he says, well, let me try to give you a sense of who Sergeant Cup is by describing the regular police. Again, I'm not able to do justice of what the professor said because I cannot copy his voice. So to give it justice, let's listen to it one more time. Um, so uh, in the Moonstone, as I said, uh, Collins did much to establish the conventions of the detective genre. Uh, I'm not going to go into the plot at length, but, uh, you know, the, the basic setup is um, there's this diamond of great, uh, of great value, um, a country house. Uh, the diamond mysteriously disappears in the middle of the night. Um, the local police are brought in uh, in an attempt to solve the crime. And they mess it up completely. Uh, and then the true hero of the book arrives. That's Sergeant Cuff. Now, Cuff, this extraordinarily important character, um, well, let me try to give you a, a sense of who Sergeant Cuff is by first describing the regular police. And uh, this is the dynamic that you're going to see throughout the history of the detective novel. Um, where you have the regular cops uh, who are well-meaning but officious and bumblingly inept. And uh, they are countered by a figure who's eccentric, analytical, brilliant, and, and able to solve the crime. So uh, first, the regular police get called in to solve the mystery. Uh, in this case, Detective uh, uh, Superintendent Seagrave. When Superintendent Seagrave comes in, uh, he orders his minions around. Uh, they bumble, and uh, they actually make a mess of the investigation, uh, which you'll see repeated. Uh, you'll see this pattern repeated, uh, particularly in the Sherlock Holmes stories of a few years later, where uh, Inspector Lestrade, this well-meaning idiot, is always countered uh, by Sherlock Holmes, uh, who's a genius. All right. So based on what we heard, what do you think is the answer? So somebody said it's letter A. As usual, it's spam. But actually, the first one to give an answer is Mr. Aureliano, Jeffrey Aureliano. Okay, he also answered letter A, followed by Galaxy. Okay, the answer here is actually letter A. Yes, these people got it right. The answer is letter A. So what supports this answer, sir? Okay, so this is the supporting uh, evidence here. So first, our professor established the conventions of the detective genre, meaning to say, this is common, this is the pattern among all detective novels. You have the police and some gifted character. So in order to highlight their differences, he gave examples of what the regular police do, uh, does, so or do rather. So they said the police are, or the professor said the police are officious and bumblingly inept. Now, for some of you, you're probably not familiar with those words. Sir, what is officious? What is inept? Is that going to happen a lot in my TOEFL exam? Words that I do not understand? How am I going to get a good score? Now, do not worry if you encounter words that you cannot understand. Look at the rest of the sentences. Look for context clues. They're going to help you understand what you just heard. So after those words, we hear the professor saying they are countered by a figure who's eccentric, analytical, Brilliant. Brilliant is a positive adjective. When someone says you're brilliant, that's a good word. That's a positive adjective right there. Countered by somebody brilliant. If you're countered by somebody brilliant, then that means the adjectives used before were negative adjectives. So even if you don't know what officious and inept mean, they, they denote negative meanings. All right? They denote negativity because they're countered by something positive. So basically, what the professor is telling us, okay, the regular cops have negative traits and they're countered by someone with a positive trait. So in this case, uh, we have Superintendent Seagraves uh, in some detective novel. He orders his minions around. 
and he is countered by Sherlock Holmes, right? And in oh sorry, Superintendent C. Graves is countered by Sergeant Cuff, uh, and it's compared with Sherlock Holmes, who counters Lestrade. So our professor is drawing parallels between the two. Okay, so you have you have Holmes, and you have Lestrade. So Lestrade is the well-meaning idiot. Holmes is the brilliant guy, and then you have C. Graves, and then you have Sergeant Cuff. If the professor established that there are similarities in the detective genre, then that means, even though it's not directly stated here, that Holmes and Cuff are the same. They're both brilliant. That means Lestrade and Seagraves are well-meaning idiots. So that means they're not the same. Sergeant Cuff is unlike the regular police. That's why letter A is the correct answer. So I had to explain it for people who are not able to get it right. But for the people who got it right, good on you. Time for you to convert to Tophilism. <laughs> now, what about organization questions? Organization questions, you have to determine how information is arranged. Is it cause it, we touched on this earlier. Is it arranged in a chronological manner? Is it arranged in, in a causal, causal manner? Is it arranged in um, a likelihood manner? Is it arranged based on general to specific? information. So you're not going to answer those things in your exam. Like, oh, the answer is, oh, likelihood. That's the arrangement, likelihood. Oh, wait, the answer is causal. No, no, the answer is problem and solution. No. Understanding how information is organized will help you understand how ideas are connected, which will eventually lead you to finding the correct answer for organization questions. So here's a sample of our organization question. Why does the professor mention a smeared bit of paint in a doorway in the moonstone? Uh, is it letter A, to describe a mistake that Sergeant Cuff has made? Is it letter B, to show how realistically the author describes the crime scene? Is it letter C, to exemplify a pattern repeated in many other detective stories? Or is it letter D, to illustrate the superior techniques used by the police? So what do you think is the answer? So let's listen to our professor one more time. So now Cuff arrives. Uh, Cuff is the man who's coming to solve the mystery. A and again, he has a lot of the characteristics that future detectives throughout the history of this genre will have. Um, he's eccentric. Um, he has a hobby that he's obsessive about. In this, uh, in this case, it's uh, the love of roses. He's a, a fanatic about the breeding of roses. A and here, think of Nero Wolfe and his orchids. Uh, Sherlock Holmes and his violin. Uh, a lot of those later classic detective heroes have this kind of outside interest that they, uh, they go to uh, as a kind of antidote to the evil and misery they encounter in their daily lives. Now, um, these detective heroes, uh, they have this characteristic of being smart, incredibly smart, but of not appearing to be smart. And uh, most importantly, from a, a, a kind of existential point of view, uh, these detectives see things that other people do not see. And that's why the detective is such an important figure, I think, in our modern imagination. Um, in the case of the Moonstone, uh, I don't want to say too much here and spoil it for you, but the clue that's key to uh, the solving of the crime is a smeared bit of paint in a doorway. Um, of course, the regular police have missed this paint smear or made some sort of unwarranted assumption about it. Cuff sees this smear of paint, um, this paint, the, the place where the paint is smeared, and, and realizes that from this one smear of paint, you can actually deduce the whole situation, um, the whole world. And that's what the hero in a detective novel like this brings to it that the other characters don't. It's, um, it's this ability to see meaning where others see no meaning and to bring order to where uh, it seems there is no order. All right. So what do you think is the answer? Pam was very quick to jump the gun. 
<laughs> she answered letter C. What about the rest of you guys? What do you think is the answer? Feel free to type it in chat. What do you think? Is it letter C? Is spam correct? Or is it letter A to describe a mistake that Cuff made? Did Cuff make a mistake? According to our professor, I mean, you have the transcript there for your reference. Is the professor discussing how realistic the author describes the crime scene? Is it letter C, letter D? What do you think, guys? Feel free to answer it, by the way. Again, it, it helps you determine if the TOEFL is for you or not. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to what exam you're more comfortable with. It's the IELTS or it's the TOEFL for you. What, what I'm saying is I'm simply highlighting the differences of these two exams based on my experience. But at the end of the day, your comfort matters. If you're more comfortable with the IELTS, then go with it. If you're more comfortable with the TOEFL, then consider it. But another factor to consider is if you've been getting bad results in the IELTS, then maybe it's just not the exam for you. And it's time for you to move on. It's like relationships. <laughs> it's not working out. You have to move on. So the answer here, Pam is correct. It's actually letter C. To exemplify a pattern. Okay. How is it that there is a pattern? How come there's a pattern? Let's look at the references here. So the first thing that the professor says is that Cuff possesses characteristics that future detectives in novels will possess. So Cuff is the, Cuff is the standard. Remember, originally, it's like the first, he's like the first detective in novels like this. And because he is the pioneer, everybody ended up copying him. So he had the hobby. He's obsessive about roses. Other detectives in novels like this, they have the same characteristic. They have uh, an obsession about something specific. So Neo Wolf was obsessive about orchids and then you have Sherlock Holmes who is obsessed with his violin, okay? So these detectives, they all have an outside interest that they can use to solve crime. So they all have this special ability to notice something that other people cannot see. And a good example of that is the smeared bit of paint. If Cuff can see the smeared bit of paint and the regular police cannot see it, it follows that detectives in other novels will have this kind of characteristic as well. Sherlock Holmes will have this kind of characteristic. Neo Wolf will have this kind of characteristic. So the last two group of words, it says there, the ability to see meaning where others no see meaning and to bring order to where it seems there is no order. So this is a characteristic of Cuff, and since Cuff is the template for all the future detectives in, in novels like this, then basically we're establishing a pattern that will be copied in other detective stories. So I hope that makes sense as to why letter C is the correct answer. For clarifications, don't be afraid to message me in chat, okay? So that's pretty much uh, the rundown of the instructions that you will receive in the TOEFL IBT for the listening section. So again, you have GIST content, uh, you have GIST purpose questions, you have function questions, you have detail questions, you have inference questions, you have connecting content, and then you have organization questions. So let's say you decided to take a practice test and you want to find out if you will hit your target score or not. So what you want to do is to divide your correct answers with the total number of items in your practice test. And what you do after that is you get the result and multiply it by 30. So let's say there are 33 items all in all and you got 28 correct answers. So divide 28 by 33, you will get 0 0.85. And then you multiply 0 0.85 by 30. That will give you your TOEFL listening score, which is 26. All right. What is a safe score in the TOEFL? If you're planning to become a nurse in the US, I'd say as much as possible, get 20 in the other three sections of the exam. You want to get 20 in reading, 20 in listening, 20 in writing, and of course, 26 in speaking. Okay. The good news about the TOEFL is, let's say you struggle with one part of the exam. They have what they call my best scores. They automatically combine your best scores from all valid versions of the exam that you've taken. So remember, the TOEFL is valid for two years. So let's say you took a test on September 23, 2021. That's valid until September 23, 2023. So think about that. If you took a test 
anytime between September 22, 2021 and September 22, 2023, then those test results are all valid. So why would I retake the test? That's expensive because there is no score review for the listening section. In the TOEFL IBT number two, again, score review has a very low chance of resulting into an increase in your score. In fact, sometimes in the TOEFL, when you apply for score review, your score can even go down, which is not the case with the IELTS. In the IELTS, it either stays the same or it goes up. In the TOEFL, it can go up, it can go down, or it can stay the same. Now, going back to my topic, which is my best scores. So let's say you did not get a good score in one part of the exam. Instead of applying for score review, rely on my best scores. So what they do at ETS, they will combine all your best scores from all valid versions of the test you've taken. So let's say you are this person. You took the test on October 19, 2019. You got 22 in reading, 22 in listening, 21 in speaking, 18 in writing. The problem, you need a better score for listening and writing. So what the examiners will do, okay, let's review your score on March 10. Wait a minute. Your score on March 10 for listening is higher than your score on October 19. Let's, let's use your score from March 10. Okay, let's check out your score for writing. Oh, wait a minute. On October 19, you got 18 for writing, but you got 20 in Ju on June 20. Let's use that score. For October 19, this is your highest possible score for speaking. For reading, this is also your highest possible score. So that's how they work at ETS, the creator of the TOEFL. But keep in mind, not all agencies, not all organizations, not all universities accept my best scores. So it's still important to coordinate with your contacts abroad first before you rely on my best scores. Is there a possibility that you will take the, the test with the same questions if the validity expired for passing the exam? I don't think that the IELTS, the TOEFL, the PTE, the CELPIP, and the OET have a habit of recycling questions immediately. There are reports where they recycled questions, but not within, let's say, the same month, not within the same year. It will probably take years before a question is recycled. Um, that's a very good question, but I, I believe that it's not a good idea to expect examiners to repeat questions. It's really better to prepare for the exam, understand test-taking strategies, regardless of the question that you get. If you understand test-taking strategies, you're going to be fine. I mean, if this is an impossible exam to pass, then there will, there will never be Filipinos abroad. But for anyone out there who is listening right now, who's watching right now, and you feel alone, you feel frustrated, you feel like my dreams will never come true because there is an English exam preventing me from making it all happen. Find comfort in the fact that other people have done it before. If you're not succeeding, revisit what you're doing. If you want something to change, you have to implement change. Because if you're doing the same thing over and over again and you're expecting different results, That's one of the fastest ways to be disappointed. If you've been studying for the longest time, then maybe it's time for you to get someone to help you. All right? If you've been approaching a question the same way, it's time for you to look for other methods. That's all there is to it. It's not impossible to get a good score in these English exams, guys. Otherwise, we don't have or we won't have Filipinos working abroad as nurses, PTs, or, or, or med techs. So, Be confident with your skills and also be patient. So when I conduct one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, be it in the IELTS or the TOEFL, this is my personal approach. I'm not saying that everyone at Tyner does this. I would like to think they all do because we're all following the, the guidance of our president, Mr. Irving Temporal. But for me personally, I have four Ps that allow me to help my students get good scores in the TOEFL and the IELTS exam. So I was talking about two students of mine in the IELTS that got better scores after remarking. I'm happy to announce that In the most recent TOEFL exam, I had a student who got a perfect score in speaking. And we all followed the four Ps. Persistence, practice, patience, and prayer. If you don't give up, you have a fighting chance to make your dreams come true. If you keep on practicing, then obviously you're developing skills that will help you get a good score. If you're patient and you understand that, that improvement and learning involves making mistakes, and when you make mistakes, it will slow you down a bit, Then if you accept that patience has to come into play here, then good job. That's a step toward the right direction. And finally, prayer. Me personally, I put God in the center of everything. If you believe that he has good plans for you and he actually does, eventually things will work themselves out.
But it doesn't mean that you're just going to lie down there and hope that everything will work itself out on its own. You have to do your part. Do your best. God will take care of the rest. And I'm not afraid to say that because I'm a Christian. That's a very vital part of my system. My TOEFL program is centered around that. Okay, I'm not praying for you because I think you're hopeless. I'm praying for you because I believe that when you talk to God about your goals and your dreams, they will eventually do come true. That's, that's the way I see it. I am not confident about my teaching skills because I'm smart. I'm confident because of Him. Everything that I say, I pray that, that to God. All right? So, um, I hope that did answer your question, Jeffrey. Sorry if I was not able to like answer it in a short manner. But basically, to summarize, yeah, they, they do repeat questions, but, but not immediately. Okay, Don't expect to see the same questions within the year. Don't expect to see them you know, in two years. It will happen, but not right away. So the best way to get a good score in any English exam, prepare, 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 and practice. Some people think practicing alone is enough. You have to practice the right way. Because if you're practicing using the wrong habits, if you're practicing based on wrong information, my goodness, then pretty much your practice did more harm than good. Okay? You, don't, you don't have to go through your preparation alone. You don't have to prepare for this exam alone. There are so many answers on the internet, but nobody's going to tell you whether it's right or wrong. And that's always the danger of self-studying. Now, people do succeed when they self-study. I'm not saying that you cannot succeed. But there's always that danger of getting wrong info and you end up developing wrong habits. So as I was saying, you don't have to do this on your own, guys. Um, a Niner will be more than happy to help you. But let's recap what we learned tonight. In the IELTS, the listening exam has a fixed duration. The speakers mostly have a British accent. You can see the question while hearing the recording. There are various types of answers because when you talk about short answer questions, you might be looking for a noun, a pronoun, an adjective, an action word, and then you also have to be worried about spelling them correctly. And in the IELTS, at the very least, you are guaranteed that every question matters. With the TOEFL, due to the presence of unscored questions, your exam can sometimes be longer or shorter. If it's shorter, good for you. You don't have unscored questions in your listening exam. So let's correct this one. This is not British accent. I think I made a boo-boo here. <laughs> this should be American accent. Okay, my bad, ladies and gentlemen. That should be American. So again, speakers in the TOEFL have an American accent for the most part. So when we say American accent, this is the kind of accent that people have in the US and in Canada. Um, another difference of the TOEFL from the IELTS when it comes to the listening section, you will hear the recording before you can see the question. So Notes, notes, notes. Very important. You will be given a piece of paper and a pencil in the TOEFL IDP. So don't worry about that. You will be given tools to take notes uh, or you can use for taking notes. All the answers are going to be in multiple choice format. Meaning to say, you always have options. You don't have to spell out words on your own. But there could be unscored questions. So bear that in mind. All right. Erase that. Clear all drawings. There you go. Okay. So to recap, our test talk series, again, in my opinion, the TOEFL speaking test can be as difficult as the IELTS speaking test. But in my experience, TOEFL speaking, more lenient examiners. In the IELTS exam, if you think that this kind, the way that I talk got me 9 or 8 in the IELTS exam, no, I got 7.5. Think about that. But with TOEFL, I got 29 over 30. That's a near perfect score. And I never changed the way that I spoke. It's pretty much the same way that I spoke for my entire life. So a near-perfect score in the TOEFL is just 7.5 in the IELTS. That's pretty weird. And then TOEFL writing is easier than IELTS writing. TOEFL reading is harder than IELTS reading. And in my opinion, TOEFL listening and IELTS listening are pretty much the same. If you're not used to the British accent, then of course the IELTS would be a problem for you. But if you're used to it, then good on you. So yeah, that's something to remember. People who want to work in the US. So like I said, you don't have to worry about all these problems on your own. Getting guidance is important. You need someone to help you. People with experience with the exam, people who have conducted research, people who have studied other examiners who can share industry secrets with you. And at 9.09er, we will be more than happy to do that for you. Whether you're taking the IELTS, the TOEFL, the CELPIP, the PTE, or the, or the PTE, or the CELPIP, or the OET rather, uh, we have review programs designed 
to address your concerns. So we have an IELTS Unlimited Review package. It will set you back by around 4,000 pesos. Not around, but exactly exactly 4,000 pesos. Our TOEFL program, um, it will set you back by 3,500 pesos. If you're undecided, you don't know what to take, we have a buy one, take 10 promo. It's uh, worth 6,000 pesos. It will give you access to our IELTS, OET, PTE, CELPIP, and TOEFL program together with review materials for NCLEX, UK CBT, UK OSK, plus visa processing and visa consultation. That's only worth 6,000 pesos. So what's the advantage of studying at 9.09er? We have our lovely dashboard created by Brainy Brian. Okay, So that's how smart Brian is. He can get a perfect score in the IELTS. He can get a perfect score in the PTE. And he can create a dashboard. What a fantastic dude. So <laughs> our Niner dashboard allows you to study anytime, anywhere. It's compatible with desktop and mobile devices. And we give you access to tests that are very similar to the actual thing. So on the screen right now is a screenshot of our dashboard. Let me just give you a tour of our dashboard, guys. All right, let me share my screen with you. Let's see. I have to log into our dashboard first. I want to show you how beautiful it is. The creation of Brainy Brian. Okay, you sign in. Once you've enrolled to 9.09, or you get access to your dashboard, you sign in. Once you sign in. So since I'm a lecturer at Niner, um, I'm one of the coaches and lecturer at Niner, I have access to all the programs. But let's say you enroll to our TOEFL program, you only get access to that. So you click your TOEFL review program. And then to your left, you will find all our courses. We have recorded lectures and you also have practice tests. So right here, we have practice tests that you can download. They're very similar to the ones that you will use in the actual exam. Uh, our practice tools are pretty much software. They're pretty much applications with the same features as the one used in the real test. Plus, we have the old school version, PDF format. There you go. And the thing about 9.09er, uh, we offer unlimited one-on-one -on -one coaching for a year. So for our IELTS program, it's 24-7. So <laughs> wherever you are, Whatever time you want to be coached, we can accommodate you. For our TOEFL program, it's from 9 a.m. up to 12 midnight. Okay, Because the demand for TOEFL is a little bit lower compared to the IELTS. But I think after this, more people will convert to TOEFLism. <laughs> so yeah, this is what our dashboard looks like. Um, you can study anytime, anywhere. And if you have questions about the lectures, you can always reach out to your coaches and your lecturers. Okay, so some skill building tips. Whether you're taking the IELTS or the TOEFL, these are things that you can do to make sure that you're going to get a good score. You want to get 7 or higher in IELTS listening. You want to get 20 or higher in TOEFL listening. These are the things that you can do. Number one, take practice tests. You have to get used to test conditions. Once you get used to that, then that means you're not only developing skills for the exam, you're preparing your body for the physical challenges of the test. This is especially true with the listening exam of the TOEFL. So in the IELTS, you start with the listening exam. You're still fresh. You're full of energy. Good for you. But with the TOEFL, it's the second exam. So the reading test has already taken away some of your energy. So it's important to take practice tests so that you also develop the endurance for dealing with the physical challenges of your English exam. Second, make sure to consume more English content. I know some of you are in love with Vicenzo. You're <laughs> enjoying watching Hometown Cha-Cha. <laughs> Maybe you're watching anime dub. It's not going to help you improve your listening skills. You're not going to be able to understand native speakers of English. For that purpose, it's better to watch more English shows and programs. In fact, for the IELTS and the TOEFL, it's better to listen to podcasts because you're listening to people who are conversing, not actually acting out a scene. So podcasts, TED Talks, and go to NPR, National Public Radio. They have a lot of recordings of lectures there. That's really good, especially for the TOEFL IDP. Also, practice taking notes. A lot of TED Talks on YouTube, they have transcripts. So what you can do, listen to a TED Talk, write down important information from the TED Talk, compare your notes with the transcript of the lecture. That will show you if you're able to take notes accurately. And then listen to a talk with someone and compare notes with that person. So these are things that you can do to improve your skills in helping you find answers in your TOEFL or IELTS listening exam. But obviously for the TOEFL, there are test-specific strategies which 
we discuss in our TOEFL review program. If you're interested, again, we do hope that you will consider joining our center and we can help you get a good score in that exam. So some credits, so photographs of this presentation are from Pexels. Uh, the presentation itself, it's from Slide Carnival. Sources of my recordings and information are IELTS and of course the official TOEFL website. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I hope that you learned something from me. I hope that I help you make a decision whether you're taking the IELTS or the TOEFL. If you want to contact me, you can find me at our official Facebook page, which is 9.09er official. Um, you can also go to our Facebook group, again, TOEFL Study Group Philippines, and then my personal account, well, not really my personal account, but my coaching account, uh, loan.viardo.73, all right? So thank you very much, IFNG, for having me. Thank you so much for the people who participated. Um, so we have questions here. Um, we have one from Miss Wendy Marie Muzonias. Um, maybe she joined us late, but like I said, um, unspoiled questions, they look like, Normal questions, but they're not worth anything. So let's say, supposedly, you're just going to have around 40 questions in your TOEFL exam, but you ended up getting 45 or 46. Six of those are not worth anything. Even if you get them right or wrong, you're not going to get points for that. And examiners add unscored questions in every version of the TOEFL to maintain its difficulty level. Okay, so there's no way of finding out whether your question is unscored or not, just treat every question as if it matters. So I hope I answered Wendy's question. Other questions, guys? So again, if you have concerns, do let me know. I'll be more than happy to respond. <laughs> and again, thank you very much uh, for our uh, moderators and admins from IFNG. Thank you so much for giving me this platform to share the gospel of TOEFL. <laughs> Well, um, sir, it's always been a pleasure to, to our all guests here in IFNG. Aside from giving us lecture about TOEFL and IELTS, plus also your um, words from the gods, so it's all it's also inspired the members. So please give a round of applause, <laughs> sir. Long. Thank you so much. So much. and yep, it, they already gave you um, the information where you can contact Niner. It's very popular. So you can just search on Facebook or send them direct message. So once again, thank you so much, Sir Loan, Sir Irvin, and to the rest of the admins of IFNG, Marvin and Gladys, and to all the members. So good luck, everyone. Thank you so much, sir, and stay safe. Okay, you so see you again guys. next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sir Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.